Great. Perhaps let me briefly take this last question regarding data lake, data mesh. I think the easy answer is it depends. If you are a startup, which has only like a little amount of data, a small domain, probably like a whole distributed data architecture is way overkill. If you have many segregated domains, like a big corporate enterprise, it might make a lot of sense to yeah, scale it out and have more teams work independently on the projects. And I think one, there's one more thing you can buy. Sholton also has made a nice class about how to efficiently use SQL with DBT, a tool I will also briefly cover in my talk. With that being said, um, I want to briefly talk about my agenda. So I will be talking how to orchestrate the modern data stack using DBT. Some of you might like the stickers. You will find more of them over there in the networking area of a nice uh, jellyfish. That's basically the logo of the tool. Thankfully, uh, the makers of Dexter were yeah, sending us some swag. Some of you might know me, others not. I'm a PhD student at the Complexity Science Hub of Vienna and TU Wien, a lecturer in Indonesia and Stuttgart, and also a senior data scientist at Magenta in Austria. By the way, at the company, we are always hiring people for engineering roles. And at the university, we're looking always for motivated, perhaps master students, PhD candidates. So if you are interested in either or, just talk to me later or perhaps hit me up on LinkedIn. I will start by covering basically the old data stack, stuff what happened before the modern data stack. Talk a little bit how it developed into a modern nice edition of that old stack, mainly by looking at ETL versus ELT tooling. Talk about what are the problems of this old way of doing the modern data stack, how this can be solved using new tools. That's the presentation part. And from that onwards, I would love to do a live demo. I don't know how well it goes. You know, live demos can always be tricky, but I hope I will be lucky. The traditional data stack usually initially extracts the data, transforms it then, and the next step is it's loading it. This means you have to know in advance what you want to do. And if something changes, usually the whole pipeline is broken. Traditionally, this was a way to handle data, but it really means that you have a very customized ingestion process. And usually we're using very expensive traditional tools like Informatica, Talent, and others. In particular, you might be even using more than a single tool. Like, uh -huh. okay, well, there's a latency, I think I want to point using my real screen. Uh, if you're using more than one of these transformation tools, there will be no like single source of truth, no end-to-end -end lineage of the transformations. And we had talked before that this engineering and data delivery is key for businesses, for reliable data pipelines, for fresh data, but also for researchers who want to have reproducible results. If you have just a random list of scripts that you're running, perhaps even Jupyter notebook cells out of order, the results you reviewers will perhaps yeah, have questions about might not be reproducible. But if you have an end-to-end -end pipeline, which consists of a couple of steps, it is much more reproducible there. The visualization layer of this data stack traditionally was done by tools like Tableau, Tableau Click, Power BI, and other like visualization engines perhaps accompanied by a data lake or lake house, which oftentimes was operated in a similar fashion like the traditional data warehouse. Some people here, I know them from the audience, are working in larger companies and perhaps can relate to this kind of style of data processing. But technology has um, yeah, advanced besides on-premise uh, appliance style data processing. More and more people moving to a cloud-based environment. There are many like cloud data warehouses out there. Some of them you find here on the list like Snowflake, uh, Redshift, BigQuery and so on. And these tools are quite easy to use for the end user, but also super powerful and with regards to scalability. This basically enabled 
to turn around the old paradigm and basically loading the data first and then transforming them on demand. So basically the ingestion process never needs to stop. You don't have to define the schema up front, but you can then later decide what you want to do. At least this is the promise of, of, of these vendors. And for a lot of people, that works quite well. Um, you might have already some simplification in the ingestion pipeline, but oftentimes uh, the pipelines here were used with like custom Python code and orchestrated from Airflow. Airflow is a tool or a second generation scheduler developed at Airbnb to overcome the limitations of a first generation scheduler like Uzi to be more like user friendly, have a nicer user interface. And it delivers on this topic, but leads to additional problems as we will see in a minute. Visualization changed to like more modern tools with the focus on self-service analytics like Luca, Mode, Periscope and others. I think the chart is way too small to read it, at least here in the room. But what you should take away from this is that Airflow basically was a tool that covered the whole like tasks that you might want to do in the data processing end to end. And people loved it so much that they basically put all the things into that single tool. Starting with very customized data transformations for loading data, for cleaning things up, for handling metrics, perhaps for dealing with A-B testing and experimentation, or like machine learning, model deployment, monitoring of models. All of these topics were stored into a single tool. And it was nice because you had some like graphs and showing some lineage. Um, but it was also a lot uh, custom code to maintain. And in particular for this transformation layer, a lot of like customized codes were written. And some of you know SQL perhaps, want to learn it after what was said before. There are tools to write more efficient SQL like DBT. It allows you to build SQL in like Lego bricks snippets where you develop bite-sized SQL snippets which are tested and they click together into Lego bricks. And many companies started to develop in-house alternatives of this open source project like DBT um, to make it compatible and more easy to develop pipelines in Airflow. Nonetheless, Airflow, for example, has a couple of deficiencies. Um, in particular, it does not integrate with these modern tools for ingestion or transformation. So it does not understand the graph of these SQL transformations that would happen in, for example, DBT. But there's more to it. Airflow has a really big and vibrant community and a lot of connectors. And some people like to choose a tool based on these connectors. But what you have to understand is when you want to move data from a source to a destination, let's say from Google Analytics to a Redshift warehouse or something like this, and then perhaps onto another system like Salesforce, you will have an exploding number of connectors that need to be supported. Obviously, this is not maintainable even for a large community. In particular, not if you want to have a high quality of uh, resulting um, connectors. What does this mean for the developers? At some point, you will observe a mix up of what these connectors are doing with your business logic. And when you're simply assuming to put a file to BigQuery or some, some data frame, it might not work. And there will be basically the boundary where your code ends, and that connector code starts, and you will face a hard time debugging it. So some very mature Airflow teams basically ended up saying, hey, we have Kubernetes, we have some managed AKS cluster somewhere in a cloud environment. Let's just use the execute script bash file processor, which works super fine, but handle the rest by ourselves. Obviously, that might be a possibility, but I think there are better choices with third generation schedulers, as we will see in a couple of minutes. Furthermore, Airflow was built to schedule jobs, one thing after the other thing. But you might have outputs, metadata, or data, which needs to be shared like from one step to the next one. This notion 
of data dependencies is not native to Airflow. This can be a problem if you're developing complex pipelines. Furthermore, as I said before, there might be uh, the intermingling of business logic with the connectors, but more importantly, you will write business logic inside of Airflow that is particular to like the resources you are using. So perhaps you're using S3 to store blob files in some cloud environment, or you're using Snowflake as a data warehouse. When you have to have these tools available for testing or development, if a new team member joins your team, they will probably have a hard time getting, start, getting started on the first day because there are so many tools and they cannot simply start to play with them like locally. And also testability in a continuous integration environment will be decreased. So developer productivity will be decreased because there are so many moving parts that you cannot easily bring up in a local environment to tinker with and, and test in an automated way easily. But what does this mean? There's no separations of these resources that you need for computation and the business logic. Take note of this, I will come back with a, a third generation scheduler and some ideas how to solve this. Furthermore, Airflow does not have like a native way of versioning DAX. I mean, perhaps, yes, you could come up with a naming convention and a version number and so on, but at least there's no like native way of doing it. You just copy a Python file with the graph of the job tasks the directory and it will just spin up. And also the workload is not isolated. Uh, the workers are not isolated from user code. So in case of failures, it might be even harder to debug them. And also setting resource limitations um, will not be enforceable in an easy or native way. It can be problematic. If you want to know more, or read on this in more detail, you find some links here on the slides that you find, I guess, using the links. So what happened with Airflow? As the technology landscape changed, people wanted to simplify the ingestion processes. More and more people started to use cloud-based data sources also for their second party, so core business assets in the cloud. Perhaps we are using a CRM system like Salesforce in the cloud, using Google Analytics or so many other tools. Obviously, it does not necessarily make sense to develop like hand-coded code to do this transformation each time manually. And some vendors have spun up like Fivetran, Airbyte, Meltano, Stitch, and others. However, this part was initially done by custom Python transformations in Airflow. Airflow did not have a native way of interfacing with these tools. The second step already teased before was the transformation step in DBT. A lot of transformations happen by running like DBT like custom SQL scripts or whatever custom transformations in Airflow. With the advent of DBT, a very standardized and useful tool came to the stack. And again, Airflow is not integrating and understanding this graph. It's like a black box node. It is not ideal when you want to understand the lineage by looking at the graph view. And as you can remember from the slide before, initially we had these lineage areas going from here to there and connecting the dots, how the data is flowing. So people like the single pane of glass, but by then separating the modern data stack into these tool silos, basically you break the observability, meaning you make it hard to debug data pipelines. But this is just two parts of a stack, ingestion and transformation. There's so much more to it. There like the metrics layers, visualization, machine learning, and so on. And a variety of other tools have spun up to tackle these problems in similar ways. Nonetheless, it is yeah, no longer integrated into Airflow and you no longer have a single pane of glass where you can get the overview. In fact, some people are making jokes about the modern data stack that we are now basically back to very much siloed data processing. And I don't know if you can read it from, from the audience. They basically say it's a set of vendor tools that solve niche data problems with regard to lineage, orchestration, and quality with the side effect of creating a disjoint data workflow that makes data folks 
knives much more complicated than before. And I think there's something true to that. Um, yeah, but some people say you have overlapping cron jobs in this modern data stack. And obviously this is not what we wanted to achieve by modernizing the data stack. We want to get the single pane of glass overview back. So how can this be achieved? I said that Airflow is a generation two scheduler. Some other projects, namely Prefect, and in particular Dexter, I will cover now, have spun up as a generation three scheduler. They truly integrate with some tools of modern data stack. As you can see here, let me get my light bulb. No, I like to highlight it. No, it's nice. They we truly integrate. So as you can see here, we have a tag like Airbyte and Airbyte. What does this mean is basically the lineage of these ingestion steps is passable by, by Dexter. And the same goes for the transformation layer. So what initially might have been like a single black box task in Airflow, like make the ingestion of this modern ingestion tool, make the transformation using the modern transformation tool is now here possible again as a like nice uh, lineage between the various data assets. What is also changing is maybe this generation three scheduler is really geared towards reproducibility, testability and developer productivity. So they have a first class notion of handling resources. You can specify, for example, if you have an SFTP ingestion pipeline that you need to copy data files like Excel sheets from a remote server over into some data warehouse that you need to have perhaps some credentials to connect to this SFTP server and you need to have the warehouse. When you're testing it locally, perhaps you might want to have a mocked FTP connector that is just working with a local file system and perhaps a mocked data warehouse that is just a SQLite instance. By having this clear notion of resources, you can scale your data pipeline down to a local development environment, but easily also scale it up to the cloud if you want to work with various other resources by only changing the configuration. This increases the testability, but also makes it easier for developers to really work locally and tinker with the pipeline. Furthermore, it includes um, yeah, native data dependencies, but more importantly, this is developed lineage first, so you will really be able to follow along what is going on in the pipeline. So it's not lineage second where you duct type and try to send it to some like governance tool, but rather you will have the whole lineage available here. Furthermore, the idea is not, not only to talk about jobs, but about data assets. Because if you have a data pipeline of like 100 steps, who is going to care about these 99 steps of your business users? No one. Only about the last step, but it's materializing the data when it's usable for the other people, then people will really care about it. And wouldn't it be nice if you would have data assets that know I depend on this previous step and this one knows I depend on this one. So if I want to update this asset here, I can just say update yourself and would know what needs to be triggered upstream in order to perform this update. And by basically rebundling the modern data stack, this can be achieved. So what do we see here on that slide? As show, explained before, we have a job view on the left side. This is sort of a black box style view where you have like one task to do the ingestion with this modern ingestion tool, in this case, Airbyte, with a transformation tool here, DBT, the modern transformation tool. And in this job view, it is not apparent that there are many assets behind the executed step. But with the native integration into these tools, we can observe that a variety of data assets are perhaps created from the transformations or ingestion layer. So this can dramatically ease the notion because even when working with a like development environment where not all the assets might be there, 
you can still see like the dependencies of what would need to be there, what perhaps test data you would need to get in order to develop on some specific parts of the pipeline. As you have always the asset definitions on the top, which allow you to get the full graph and then materializations as a second layer um, to bear it also pragmatics about the assets that you care about. With this being said, I would love to jump now over into a demo starting and showcasing you some basic principles of how to interact with Dexter. And please, Sholten or someone tell me when the time is over, because basically I yeah, could do a demo for quite a long time. Um, starting with this Hello World, perhaps from PowerPoint, um, and then diving deeper into the UI, you will see that there's only very limited amount of changes that are needed to get basically a pure Python script into a nice documented job or graph index. What you need to change, or basically only need to change is you need to perform an annotation of a function with the add op annotation. That's the most simple case. In case you want to pass additional configuration to it, you can feed the configuration in details and braces to this function. What you can also do is you can specify the resources as a key value pair for this specific operation. If there's enough time, we can yeah, look at this together in the live demo, but otherwise you will find also blog posts with accompanying examples code that you can check out later. These operations at some point chained into a job. Here you will see basically a regular chaining of Python functions that are basically getting the output of one task as input for the next one. And this is super powerful because you have a native concept of data dependencies here. Some of you might say, okay, this is a dummy use case and the data is small, so this is naively going to work. How do I work with like petabytes of big data here? Well, Dexter has the concept of resources and you cannot only specify like a compute instance, perhaps a Spark cluster or something else, but you also have an IO manager. And the IO manager can handle the materialization of these asset definitions. Perhaps you might start with a CSV IO manager to read some CSV file from a remote file share, but then store it into Snowflake with a Snowflake IO manager. You might have an S3 blob storage IO manager that can handle uh, yeah, files in a blob storage system and so on. So this makes it also easy to again abstract away the functionality that can be error prone when handling state in tested modules. Let's now yeah, go over into a demo for the hello world function. Perhaps a brief yeah, words about the user interface. So we here see the hello world function, which is the result of the annotated Python code. And already nice documentation will show up with the doc string of Python. And in case you follow the Python best practices with regards to type hints, these will also show up here in the user interface. I did not for the hello world task, you will see that the result is undefined and defaulting to any. But if you have a nicer type definition, let's say perhaps a pandas data frame, perhaps even uh, joined with Pandera like type level annotations, which would say I have some column names with certain data teams, uh, data types and allowed ranges of values, they would nicely and directly show up here in the user interface and give you type-based data pipelines. When you want to launch the job, you can go to the launch pad, basically select the job. We only have a single matching job, so we can just give it to star and launch the run. What you will see here is that the job is kicked off in the background here in this dummy example with a local process-based scheduler. In a more production grade deployment, you could, for example, use Kubernetes to spin up some instances in a cluster. But what you also observe, we have a nice like gun chart style view of the various steps and, and some really observable logging downstairs here. You can easily like disable certain types of logging or enable them. And you will see details about the IO manager, about materializations and so on. I talked about assets before. Assets are the core data things that your business users will care about. Usually you want to track metrics about them. Let's say the number of rows or some specific data quality indicators. 
The nice thing about the extras, you can simply yield these metrics here and they will be available for the data asset. We'll make a nice like chart out of them. Let's perhaps first look into a second example with regards to data validation. I think I should try to increase the font so that you can view it here and also on Zoom. We have some contrived data set of stock prices and they have some values. In the Python ecosystem, two tools have developed for type checking. One is Pandera and the other one is Pydantic. They're commonly used and have an easy way of defining like specific data, data types and value ranges. Here, for example, we would say that a certain column does not need to be null or must not be null and should be greater than zero. We are inducing some null values here. So what we will see is when I showcase that, yes, for, for the code, I will do that in a minute once I have found the right job here because there are many prepared and I need to select the right one. Here's the browser. Let me, is this viewable, Sultan? Yeah. So here we will have a stock prices task. It's again a little bit contrived example. Nonetheless, what you will see here already is the type annotation. So we will see that the type is well defined. We can click it and get details here. In fact, the details that were specified here. So it's not like documentation that is then perhaps invalidated, but rather it's executable code that will, that will auto document itself. Here you will see the documentation of the text and so on and the constraints that are applied. Once we launch the task here again, we have a launch pad. This time we would expect to get an error message as we are using some explicit null values here, which would not be allowed. As you see, we get a nice like failure message here. And in fact, we can look at it in detail and we'll observe that something which should not be null is indeed null. And yeah, someone needs to handle that problem. I'm yeah, hearing better, we are only a couple of minutes left. So let's briefly showcase also a little bit about the assets that I was talking about. The assets can be viewed in two ways. One is the traditional job view, which is basically the, the tool behind the scenes that is used to materialize the individual steps. But as you can see here, if you're using these modern tools for ingestion or transformation, they are not very insightful because you have one step, anything could ha be happening there. But what can be changed, and this is the interesting thing about Dexter, with the native integration into these tools of a modern data stack, these silos can be bridged. And you get then a nice lineage of the various data assets that are part of it. And what you will also notice with the lineage, we can see here that it knows that something has changed. It will notify you if you run some steps up here, that these ones might be stale and should be updated perhaps. What you can observe here, about the asset, some specific like data was tracked, some location where it is stored, perhaps some values. If you view it in the asset catalog, you will see I was only tracking a string. So it, there's nothing to plot. But I think, let me see if I briefly find another um, example. So, yeah, I guess not, because somehow I find not the back button in the browser right now, because the Zumba is on top of it. Unless I think you can guess if there was a numeric data and that was changing run by run, here there would be a nice plot. I think this is it, what I want to show you for now. There's much more that could be talked about. In particular, Dexter also allows to integrate with like um, Jupyter notebooks. A lot of people might be using them for research and loving them, but they have a problem that researchers usually not necessarily go linearly, like step by step, but this thing first and that, 
code and then something here and for someone else to follow along with super impossible and also not for, for the lineage of the data processing. The re results will no longer be reproducible. But Netflix developed a tool called Paper Mill that can basically parameterize these notebooks and as long as they execute linearly, allows to integrate them into a data pipeline. Dexter has an integration for Paper Mill named uh, Dexter Mill. Then it allows you to natively include the execution of these notebooks into the ETL or like transformation pipeline. And I think this can be really powerful to get the data science code and the models we were talking about in the first talk into production faster. With that being said, I think, Sholten, I would hand the work over to you and we would be looking forward to some questions. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot, Gerhard. And we have plenty of questions, so let's just spend a few minutes uh, with questions because uh, after that we'll still need like three minutes of your attention before we go for uh, for a drink here. So the most popular question: If someone swaps the new stuff and a new better alternative comes out, do you think they should instantly swap, or how frequently how frequently should they swap? You mean the version of a specific tool I was talking about, about any technology in the stack? I, I think it's it's more like switching from Airflow to Dexter or Dexter to the, the new technology that will come up tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I think it depends if on the pain of the limitations. I was talking about the problems with Airflow. So if you have a big existing Airflow cluster and you don't feel the problems, perhaps it's not worthwhile for you to switch. But usually people who really have a big cluster with Airflow will feel the problems. And in fact, Dexter has a compatibility mode where you can develop locally using all the niceness of Dexter, but then execute on an Airflow cluster. So if you want to kind of get the best of both worlds for a time, of course, you have this old cluster that wants to be utilized, you could go like this. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Let me go with the, with the next one. What do you think of running Dexter or DBT fully on premises over traditional enterprise DBs like Oracle, SQL Server, or anything like this? So it's certainly doable. Um, what you have to notice is well, that like enterprise people usually care about um, support. And I said, I have to say that the Oracle connector, for example, is so far not commercially supported from, from like the DBT team. Though I know that there's a good open source community connector and it depends on how yeah, well your I think enterprise can deal with these topics that there might be no like central big company to, to handle. But if you, you can yeah, work with this setup, then for sure it will work. It will take a JDBC connection and will just deliver what it promises. Okay, next question. Is DEXA necessarily for smaller pipelines? Wouldn't GitHub Actions or GitLab CI be enough? I think every project starts small. And as you have seen before, I should also go back on the slides for like two steps. Like for a simple pipeline, like the Hello World one, where is it? This is basically the amount of code that you would want to have. And I think GitLab actions and this stuff, they could be used to trigger it. But once you want to talk about the lineage of operations are interconnected, this is something that is not really part of, of, of these user interfaces. Think about Lambda functions in AWS. It's deceptively easy to just use like a bunch of Lambda functions and one triggering something else. Obviously, it's super easy to get started on this and Amazon is selling you onto it but forget about lineage if you don't start to think about it from the beginning. And this is where you could perhaps use the lineage during development and debugging, but if you wanted to trigger this script from um, GitHub Actions CI or so, it would totally be possible to just use Dexter within the, the CI environment. Okay, thank you, Georg. We have a couple more. What about the costs through the improvement of the data science project? Shouldn't they subtract the estimation of the worth? Okay, the worth of the data science project. I think that's more like a question to Gabor. So let me, Gabor will be on stage in a few minutes. So um, he'll be able to answer this. So a question, is there a European data warehouse? A European? A European data warehouse company. I 
believe. Like if you want to do anything in the cloud, usually they have routes uh, somewhere else, but usually these cloud providers have a location in Europe where the data center sits in Europe. But um, I don't know, Sholtan, you are also very deep into the data engineering spec. Is there some pure Europe-based? Um, I don't know. So I don't know about like any prominent uh, European. But, but there's a less prominent one, and I'm using that in the pipeline here at StuckDB. So basically, it's not like a fully fledged enterprise grade warehouse. It's more like SQLite, but for analytics. But it can be super powerful and easy to use. But if you have multiple users accessing it, it's perhaps not the right tool for the job. But if you have like as a researcher, perhaps on, on your laptop with the econometrics data that is growing larger and larger problems with R and so on, using DuckDB and some SQL might really like use all the cores on the machine, not just a single thread, and really speed up the computations. So that could be worthwhile depending on what is your use case. And they are thing from the Netherlands or Sweden, I don't know. Okay, so DuckDB. All right, uh, people are just flowing in. <clears throat> Uh, so, just one more sec. I think we answered many of these. When is Dexter the wrong tool, and when should one stick to Airflow? I think that is something regarding the community and your also interest in writing code. Like traditional ETL tools, let's say Informatica and so on. They always promised a sort of no code, low code approach where you drag some boxes on the screen and then will auto generate the code. Dexter is the opposite way. You have to write the code yourself and then you will really know what it is doing, but it will exactly do what you have defined it to compute. So if you have the people to write the code to do the transformations, then that is certainly something for you. Talking about resources in IO managers, the community in Dexter is not yet as large as in perhaps other tools. So you will not find like an abundance of connectors, IO managers or resources, unless the important ones are there. And as said before for Airflow, even if you have a large community, not necessarily the point-to-point -point connections you care about are there in high quality. Okay, thank you. Um, just an afterthought, so uh, probably most of you know Snowflake, the big data warehouse brand. I believe they are originally French. And uh, if you take a look at the Snowflake commercials, like what they put on their video, they are super good, so cute. So yeah, definitely something around that area. Okay, our next question. What about Apache Iceberg handling files stored on S3 as data lake in the Dexter context? It's an interesting question because it's not related to like the scheduling and orchestration part. So I'm not fully sure how to answer it, but basically if you have an IO manager, your custom IO manager that is working with files in object store like S3, it knows how to handle, let's say a CSV file, an image, a parquet file, or perhaps an iceberg table, then it can totally just work with Dexter. And that's the nice thing about IO managers. They exactly do what you tell them to. Is this the answer to your question, Jordan? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's a little bit, a little bit outside of the scope of Dexter if it uses Iceberg or any other. No, I mean, like, like it's abstracted away. You have IO managers. Your IO manager is going to handle whatever file format you want to materialize. And if you want to materialize in, in Parquet or like Iceberg or Delta, it will. Yeah, you have to write a code for it, but then it will just do what you want it to do. Okay, and the last question. Any idea how they, I we are here with, with they, it's, the, it's Dexter, the company, do data warehousing AI analytics in China? Do they use the same tool stacks? Oh no, it's they is just for the people. So how does one do data analytics in China if they use the same stack? If the, and probably what you might be able to answer, are they part of the community? Like, do you see? If, if it's of, like the uh, people, people of from Dexter China. are part of the community in China. Or probably more like uh, Chinese people, how active are they in the Dexter community? Um, I think that's a hard question to answer. But what I can tell you is in the time leading up to this talk in preparation of a blog post as backing this talk, I was creating code examples and documentation. And just the day before uh, yesterday, someone with a name from either Japan or China, I assume, 
wrote me a message on Slack and he was super grateful that these examples were helping them to get things done. So I think there is some link to the community in China. Okay, so rest assured. All right, uh, okay, last question and then uh, no more. Uh, we'll have then Gabor on stage again for a second. Can one use Dexter for very big data items, for example, videos that cannot really be kept on in the memory of a worker? Yeah. So I think if you're asking this question, you're not understanding the value of data orchestration. If you have an existing tool, let's say Spark or whatever, that is doing a distributed computation, you can orchestrate and use these tools from your data orchestrator, be it Airflow or Dexter or Prefect or something else. And if your existing tool like Spark can handle that out of core processing, Dexter, for example, just make it easier to integrate it into your pipelines to get the overall lineage. And I think that's just it to it. Okay, thanks. So the processing does not take place in the worker, but rather in that resource. You would have a resource, let's say Databricks Spark cluster or EMAS Spark cluster. That one would do the heavy lifting. Okay, thank you, Georg, and thanks for answering all the questions. <laughs>